Okay. I hope things have felt pretty logical until now. And I, I want you to know that they're still logical. It just, it, it's easy to lose it for a second. So what I really want to do is I want to try to predict um, when you should get on the bus and when you should get off the bus if you're oxygen, okay? And, and so um, our little hemoglobin bus that we have here, okay? Under what circumstances should oxygen get on the bus? Under what circumstances should it get off the bus? So let's talk about that related to what you know about systemic and pulmonary capillaries. And then really what, what I'm going to do is you're going to predict um, and then I'm going to confirm for you, okay, some variables. So you predict for me. Um, all the things that are true at pulmonary capillaries, all of them that are true there, and we'll talk about what's true there, should favor doing what? Do you want to, at pulmonary capillaries, have oxygen get on the bus so that it can go to work, or do you want it to get off, the, get on the bus to travel to work, or get off the bus, okay? So what I want in these spaces is do I want, um, to load or unload oxygen and then also load or unload carbon dioxide. So let's talk about that and try to predict it. So um, let's see. So um, factors in pulmonary capillaries, everything here, hopefully it'll make sense to you, everything there should favor oxygen doing what? What do you think, guys? oxygen should at pulmonary capillaries choose load or unload it should load everything that is true at pulmonary capillaries should favor um, oxygen getting onto the bus so that it can be carried to someplace more important not necessarily more important but someplace where it can do its job and what do you think about carbon dioxide? What should carbon dioxide do at pulmonary capillaries? Should it get onto the bus if it's going to, um, should it get onto the hemoglobin bus so that it can travel around, for instance, and go down this direction? Or should it get off the hemoglobin bus? What do you think? I think that carbon dioxide, if it, would, if it was on the bus, it should get off. All right, so let's look at the factors in systemic capillaries. So now we are going to be talking about systemic capillaries down here, okay? So what should be going on down here, guys? The factors that are true at systemic capillaries should favor oxygen doing what? What do you want oxygen to do at systemic capillaries? Do you want more oxygen to get on the bus? Or do you want oxygen to get off the bus so that it can do its cellular respiration work? So factors that are true in systemic capillaries should favor unloading uh -huh, unloading of um, oxygen onto the hemoglobin bus and loading of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, notice, um, carbon dioxide, oops. what I'm talking about as soon as I okay so oxygen notice is moving off the bus into the cells carbon dioxide is moving out of the cells potentially onto the bus okay so all right so now let's talk about um, how oxygen is carried around in the blood and then just keep those predictions in your head so that all I can do is give you examples that confirm your predictions. And again, if you are following me, what should happen at um, the pulmonary capillaries is that you should pick up oxygen because it's got to go somewhere and you should drop off carbon dioxide because it's got to be breathed out. And at the systemic capillaries, it's the opposite. So oxygen transport in the blood. So let's talk about how oxygen is carried around in the blood. So the way that oxygen is carried around in the bloodstream is um, 
at any given moment, let's see, 17.6a. Hold on, let me pull up the right picture. Okay. Here's, um, at any given moment, the vast majority of oxygen is inside the red blood cell on the hemoglobin bus, but a little bit of it is like on its way to and from the bus, maybe at the bus stop, okay? So 1.5% of PO2 at any given time is dissolved in the blood plasma on the way to or from, but 98.5% of it percent is like inside the red blood cell. So most of it rides on bus, okay? So now what we have to do is we have to figure out um, what is going to determine how much oxygen combines with hemoglobin. The other way of saying that is I need to figure out what, what determines um, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, okay? How likely is it to bind? And most of these things will be pretty logical if you will let them, but I understand that they're a little bit of skull crunchers. So what I'm really talking about here is what makes it more likely that oxygen will get on the bus, okay? And what makes it more likely that oxygen will get off the bus? And remember that your prediction is that everything that was true at pulmonary capillary beds should favor oxygen getting onto the bus and everything that was true at systemic capillary beds should favor oxygen getting off of the bus. So let's look at that. So what are the factors that determine how much oxygen combines with hemoglobin or the fancy way of saying that um, hemoglobin's affinity. Um, so um, hemoglobin's affinity will predict the he uh, uh, hemoglobin saturation. So the first one is just simple basically says if you've got more oxygen, more oxygen is going to bind to hemoglobin. And so that the fancy way of saying that, just look here, it's not as bad as you think it is. More oxygen, greater millimeters of mercury of PO2, more saturation of oxygen onto hemoglobin. That's pretty logical, isn't it? Okay. So um, the higher the PO2, the more oxyhemoglobin is formed. So higher PO2, predicts loading of oxygen onto hemoglobin for transport, which is true at the lungs. Um, in lungs, basically, hemoglobin gets 90% saturated even when your PO2 is relatively low because the PO2 in the air is so high. There's a really good gradient. So the opposite is also true. If PO2 drops, um, you get less oxygen loading onto the bus. Uh, 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 hemoglobin will dissociate from oxygen and will like move off. So here's the relationship. Higher concentration of PO2, greater saturation, more likely to carry the oxygen. So um, lower concentration of PO2, more likely to unload the oxygen. So that is sort of the differences that you've got at the two capillary beds. Um, so one more time, PO2, higher PO2, favors loading, lower PO2 favors unloading. Okay, the next thing is PCO2. So um, PCO2, so I want you to think about which of these capillary beds would have a higher PCO2. So which of these capillary beds is generally going to have more carbon dioxide? Hopefully it makes sense to you that the systemic capillary beds where carbon dioxide is being generated and not being gotten rid of by ventilation generally have higher um, PCO2. So not surprisingly, higher PCO2 favors unloading. As the PCO2 increases, you're less likely to hold on. So as more carbon dioxide gets on the bus, um, oxygen is a little more likely to get off. Think of the bus as being crowded, don't know. Okay. So next concept is pH. So once again, I'm torturing you with the same damn equation that you have seen all semester long. Um, as pH, as carbon dioxide changes, pH changes. And the general relationship is as carbon dioxide goes up, H plus goes up and therefore pH goes down. So before we get any further, which of these two capillary beds, therefore, do you think is going to have a lower pH? the one with more carbon dioxide, right? Okay, so this one is gonna have a lower pH and that allows you to predict that lower pH should probably cause what? Loading or unloading. What do you wanna do at systemic capillary beds? 
you want to unload at systemic capillary bed. So the trend is that a higher pH, which should be relatively higher, we're not talking about super basic, but if you compare um, the pulmonary capillary beds to the systemic capillary beds, these are probably slightly higher pH. Higher pH favors loading, getting onto the bus, and lower pH favors unloading, getting off of the bus. Okay, next thing is just temperature. Okay, which of the capillary beds do you think is going to be higher temperature as generated by either high metabolic rate or just not being cooled down as much? Which of these two capillary beds do you think is going to be a higher temperature? I predict that the systemic capillary beds, especially in actively respiring tissues, are going to be a higher temperature. So what happens is an increase in temperature causes what you would expect it to. An increase in temperature causes unloading. So here's our, there's pH, there's temperature. So as um, the temperature goes up, um, you become desaturated is what that is saying. So an increase in temperature causes a dissociation or an unloading. So that's what that one does. And um, if you think about it, these the lungs are generally going to be cooler than your really respiring tissues in the warm core of your body. So um, temperature, increased temperature increases unloading uh, from hemoglobin. Okay, and then this next one is a little hard to uh, conceptualize, but we can do it. Okay, there, um, okay, let's talk about red blood cells for just a second. Red blood cells um, don't have any organelles to speak of, no nucleus, no mitochondria to speak of. So when they produce energy, they do it primarily by gly glycolysis because they don't have mitochondria. So um, as their metabolism increases, um, they generate this byproduct called BPG, which is 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? I won't make you spell it out. And so as a red blood cell, which is basically just uh, an, a gas bus um, or gas ferry, not flat, flat, um, but toot, toot, ferry. Um, as BPG increases, what happens is, I don't know, the red blood cell goes, I'm really, really working hard. Maybe you are too, and you need this oxygen. So as the BPG increases inside the red blood cell, what it does actually is um, pushes oxygen off. So increased BPG indicates that the red blood cell has more metabolic needs. And the red blood cell, I don't know, the metaphor that works for me is it thinks, oh, if I'm working hard, you must be working hard and I don't need this oxygen. How about you take it? So increased BPG favors unloading. Okay, so what it does is it combines with oxyhemoglobin and pushes oxygen out. Um, so an increase in the BPG pushes metabolic oxygen off of hemoglobin, decreases its affinity for hemoglobin. So here's a summary. Again, back to the beginning. Everything that is true in systemic capillaries should and does favor unloading of oxygen. It should get off the bus and go to work. Work is cellular respiration. Okay, talk about what those things are in just a second. Everything that is true at pulmonary capillary beds should favor oxygen getting onto the bus loading, okay? So here is comparatively what's true at the two of them. In the systemic capillaries, let's do those first. Everything should favor oxygen getting off the bus because it's got crap to do. In systemic capillaries, comparatively, there is a lower PO2, a lower pH, a higher PCO2, a higher temperature, and if it's active, a higher BPG. All of that, should and does favor unloading. So oxygen will get out and go to work, okay? In the pulmonary capillaries though, everything that is going on there should and does favor oxygen loading onto the hemoglobin so that it can travel, okay? So what is true comparatively in pulmonary capillaries? Higher PO2, higher pH, lower PCO2, lower temperature, and sometimes lower BPG, especially if they're less active. All of those things being true favors loading at pulmonary capillary beds. Whew. Okay, one last little tidbit, and then we are finished with that part. And that last little tidbit is 
carbon monoxide, the little bastard, carbon monoxide, which of course you can get from burning fossil fuels. It's not, not like the gas you would smell if you left your stove on, but if your furnace wasn't properly vented, a byproduct of burning fossil fuels, even burning organic material like wood can do it too, and definitely burning gasoline and burning natural, natural gas in your house. Well, the deal is that um, those are organic compounds that you are burning. They have oxygen. They have carbon in them. Carbon minox monoxide is a byproduct of burning fossil fuels. It is colorless and it is odorless. Um, the deal with that little bugger is that it can combines relatively irreversibly. Um, it's hard to get it off. It's not impossible with the heme groups on hemoglobin. So your buses get full with fake oxygen, taking up oxygen seat, which makes your blood bright red, but it doesn't like get off the bus to go to work. It just like rides the bus around and around and around and takes up more seats. So your blood is bright, bright red, but you're really, really hypoxic. So what it's really doing is it's pretending that it's oxygen and taking up these seats. And the more you breathe it in, the more oxygen seats that it takes um, up. So what happens with that is um, uh, you can eventually basically expire because of hypoxia, called hypoxemic hypoxia. And um, it happens not uncommonly. And that's why we all need carbon monoxide detectors when our houses are heated by organic materials like natural gas. Okay, um, we will stop there and then I will do carbon dioxide. We're almost done.